Hey everyone, John for Nintendo Life here, and let's shift down the tone, because we're about to get a bit deep. So I feel like it's much easier to appreciate what we had, rather than what we currently have. And if I've learned anything during these videos, is that many of you really appreciate the Wii U. But during the Wii U's time, everyone hated that thing. And while I still appreciated it during its era, there were definitely lulls. Like from the launch until Pikmin 3, which came months and months after, there was very little to play. But in retrospect, the library was quite special. We had things like Nintendo Land and Xenoblade Chronicles X and Paul Block's World. So many games that were exclusive to that system and still are. And many of those games got a second life on the Switch. So could it really have been that bad? But now we're kind of at a point where people are looking at the Switch, which is a major success, but many people are saying, okay, but where's the legacy? What are we gonna look at in years from now and say, whoa, that was great. And I think we've had many of those experiences. So what I wanna do now, seeing as Nintendo is saying we're halfway through the Switch's life, is take a look at those moments and reflect and see what special things happened during the Switch era. Now, defining the word special means different things to different people, but in this video, I wanna focus on things that just couldn't have happened in previous generations or were very unlikely to happen. So it's not just something like, oh, Mario got a game and it was good, and Zelda got a game and it was good. We're going beyond that. Things that were really unlikely and very special to the Switch era. So without further ado, pre-recorded John, take it away. <laughs> Okay, one of the coolest things that's happened that doesn't get the respect it deserves is Nintendo re-released their arcade games. This one's very important, Donkey Kong. This original arcade version has been stuck in licensing hell since basically its release. If you've played a port of Donkey Kong, it was probably this version, the NES version. It was a decent conversion for the time, but this just isn't the arcade one. It was much slower and more limited with fewer sprites and an entire level was cut. You might have even played Donkey Kong Original Edition, which came to Wii and 3DS. To put it simply, this is an official NES ROM hack. It's NES Donkey Kong with the Pi level. Arcade DK was also in Donkey Kong 64, but this likewise wasn't legit. It's really close, but Rare outright remade the game for Donkey Kong 64. This isn't the arcade ROM. So from 1981 until 2018, the game that made Nintendo what it is today was not being preserved every other version wasn't accurate. But when Nintendo struck a deal with the Arcade Archives line, something brilliant happened. It took 37 years, but Arcade Donkey Kong was finally in the home environment. There was even a Tate mode where you can play it vertical like the arcade game. There's different versions of the arcade release in here. It's great. Historically, this is probably the biggest thing that's happened in the Switch era. It's just such a big deal. And it wasn't alone. Donkey Kong Jr. got a port too. The arcade Punch-Out is on Switch, and this is nothing like the NES version. It's an entirely different game and looks and plays so distinctly. It's a must-have for Punch-Out fans. There's also Mario Brothers and Donkey Kong 3 and Soccer, but this one is a huge deal. Skyskipper. This was one of Nintendo's earlier games alongside DK, and the art was drawn by Miyamoto. What makes this so special though is the game is crazy elusive, and preserving it was looking near impossible. Deep in Nintendo's archives was an arcade cabinet, and they extracted the ROM and released the game untouched, exactly like it was in 1981. This game never left Japan, so an entirely new Nintendo game for the West was massive. That's not even it for arcade archives. There's the Versus series, which are basically arcade versions of NES games. Versus Super Mario Bros., Versus Balloon Fight, Versus Excite Bike. A lot of these, like Versus Super Mario Bros., just kind of change a couple of placements and make things a little bit harder, but other ones are a bit more drastic than that. This entire line, though, one of my favorite things to happen in the Switch era. It's so cool. Next, Final Fantasy VII finally came to Nintendo. This ad didn't age well. Take that print media guy from the late 90s because Final Fantasy VII is finally on a cartridge. If you don't know the history, basically Final Fantasy was a Nintendo franchise from the first game up until the sixth game, and Final Fantasy VII was planned for N64, but because Nintendo went for cartridges, Square went straight to Sony. This changed everything for Final Fantasy. Not only VII, but eight and nine were also PlayStation exclusive, and then X was. And then it didn't stop. 11 was PS2 and PC. 12 was PS2. It took until the 360 with Final Fantasy 11 and 13 for Square to finally leave PlayStation. But even in that time, Nintendo was left behind, and the prior games stayed exclusive to Sony. The GameCube and Wii had Crystal Chronicles, and the GBA and DS had some old ports, but 7, 8, 9, 10, and 12 wouldn't leave PlayStation. That is, until 2019. 
every single one of those games came to Switch and Xbox, breaking the exclusivity. Of course it was much more than just Final Fantasy VII, but that game was such a big deal and started the entire movement. But no, all these games are on Nintendo, and that's such a huge thing historically. <laughs> Smash I think we as fans have kinda lost focus of what Smash Bros. Ultimate is. When this game was first revealed, Sakurai said don't expect too many fighters, but now, we're at a point where Smash Ultimate has more newcomers than any other entry in the series. So now we just kind of focus on who's coming next, but that's not the point of this game. Do you remember how excited people were seeing the Ice Climbers, or Pichu, or Snake? Smash Ultimate is the ultimate Smash, bringing absolutely everyone back. That is no small feat. Every character is someone's favorite, and there's now over 80 of them. How do you top that? The answer is probably, they don't. Doing this again is basically impossible. Smash Ultimate was the culmination of decades of work. So much time and love and passion was poured into this game. Everything that Smash is and has been and will be is present. And if we do touch on the newcomers, good lord, so many dreams came true. Ever since the Smash Melee intro, so many people wanted Ridley. He was a background element in the first game, a boss in Brawl, a stage boss in Smash 4. It felt like they were trying to get Ridley in there, but they just couldn't figure him out. But they did it. Ridley was the first brand new fighter announced for this game. That's how big of a deal he was for Smash fans. And then, we got Simon Belmont. He's been a massive request since Brawl. And God, we got freaking Banjo and Kazooie. There's always bound to be another character you want in this game, but Smash Ultimate covers so many bases and has done so, so much. The point was never the new fighters, but they are such a delicious frosting and an already deliciously baked cake. G give me a slice. <laughs> When Brace Yourself Games, the developers of Crypt of the Necrodancer, approached Nintendo, they wanted Zelda content in Crypt of the Necrodancer. But Nintendo said, Why don't you just make an original Zelda game? And here we go, Cadence of Hyrule, an independent studio, made a Zelda game. One of Nintendo's biggest IPs, made by an indie. That just doesn't happen. But here we are, and it was glorious! It plays just like Crypt of the Necrodancer, but there's just so much Zelda DNA crammed into here. The pixel art is absolutely stunning, and the music, oh, my ears, my ears are still dancing from 2019. You basically traverse Hyrule in beat with a tune, and all your attacks and movements are to that rhythm. But you also get classic Zelda items, and there are dungeons with bosses. Every single Zelda fan should play this, and when I tweeted about it, so many people hadn't even heard of it before. That's just disappointing. It's really good. <coughs> the original Fire Emblem got localized. Not for long. But it did. So Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon is no stranger to remakes. The Super Nintendo got one in Japan, and the DS got one globally. But the original incarnation of Fire Emblem never left Japan up until this point. At the time the buzz was all about 3D All-Stars, but Nintendo pulled the exact same maneuver with Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light. This launched on the 4th of December 2020 and existed for just 3 months on the eShop. If you bought it, you can still play it. If you didn't, you're kind of out of luck. So this is the original Famicom game, just officially translated to English. Some may say, why does it matter? We have the DS game. But this is where the series started. It's the legacy. It's like saying, why does the first Metroid matter when we have Zero Mission? Some people do say that, but they're different games. They have their own merits. Even if it's a lesser game than the remake, historically, this matters. Nintendo did this a bit in the Wii U era with games like Earthbound Beginnings. That's Mother 1, officially localized for the first time. I live for this stuff. Please do more of this. But the difference is with Mother, that localization already existed, just Nintendo didn't release it. Fire Emblem was entirely new, and for some reason it was just done for three months. That was really disappointing, but the release of this game was very cool. Okay, so I've got a problem. I think this looks really normal. And I shouldn't, because four years ago, the idea of Mario wielding a firearm and fighting with the Rayman Raving Rabbids? That was totally bizarre, and we've all just kind of accepted it now, and this is no longer strange. Mario walking through a sci-fi wasteland with a firearm is no longer strange. That's a problem, because this entire game is ludicrous. Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle was a phenomenal game. It's a turn-based strategy game in the Mario Kingdom, with Rabbids, and again, with kind of guns. Like Smash, we've just kind of accepted it, even though we totally shouldn't. This is the kind of game that if you described to someone in like 2015, they wouldn't believe you. Because one, the Rabbids, they weren't, they weren't in their prime anymore. 
They were very much of the Wii era, and they were kind of losing their steam even then. Rabbids Land on the Wii U surprisingly didn't do it for them, but here they are, Mario Plus Rabbids, and now it's getting a sequel. It's not Nintendo's only crossover with Ubisoft, as Star Fox came to Starlink. Do you remember Starlink? There was a pretty cool Star Fox campaign in there. That's not quite as bizarre as Mario and Rabbids crossing over, but it was very cool. But yeah, the weirdest thing is Mario Plus Rabbids is very good, and I fully trust the team to deliver again. <coughs> Microsoft and Nintendo have had a very strange relationship this generation. Cuphead isn't owned by Microsoft, but they helped fund the game, and during an indie presentation, Nintendo said, You can thank Studio MDHR for making their award-winning game so special, and our friends at Microsoft for helping us bring Cuphead to even more players. And you know what came after that? Ori and the Blind Forest, one of the very best games of the last generation, and after that came Ori and the Will of the Wisps. When you start these games up, it says Xbox Game Studios. On a Switch, I've still not accepted this. Much like Minecraft, in Ori and the Blind Forest, you can also earn achievements. So on your Xbox profile, it will say Minecraft Nintendo Switch Edition and Ori and the Blind Forest Nintendo Switch Edition. For some reason, Will of the Wisps didn't have this, but still, it was really cool. And then of course, like we said earlier, Banjo and Kazooie came to Smash, and so did Steve, which Microsoft also owns. While Microsoft owned Bethesda, the Dragon Ball Mii costume also came to Smash. It's been a really strange relationship, but Xbox games have come to Switch completely uncompromised. They were both spearheading crossplay too. At a time where Sony wasn't playing ball, Xbox and Nintendo could play together. Sony are more on board now, but at the time, it was just Nintendo and Microsoft holding hands and galloping through a field. Now granted, this isn't the first time. While Microsoft owned Rare, the DS still had some Rare IP. Rare made Diddy Kong Racing DS, and Viva Piñata had a DS game. But this I feel is different. Those were made very specifically for handhelds, whereas this is taking Xbox games and putting them on the Switch. There's even been rumours of Game Pass eventually coming, and Phil Spencer keeps teasing something Switch related. The future looks very bright for these two. <coughs> Sonic Mania. Alright, I'm a huge Sonic fan. I've played and enjoyed pretty much every game, but even I can tell you that there was a dip. Of course there was a dip. It's not very often we get truly fantastic games, and Sega have shown a few times they just can't quite get the classic formula right. Sonic 4 was average at best, and the classic design and controls in generations, they weren't accurate. They were fun, but it wasn't really classic Sonic. And so Sega recruited the help of fans. Sonic Mania is just a dream come true. Every single pixel of this game is utter perfection. It feels just like classic Sonic, but better. The points in the originals where the quality starts to dip, that is not in Mania. These guys understood what makes Sonic so good, and Mania is just such a feel-good game. The original levels are some of the best in the series, and the reimagined ones, they recapture what you love, but they grow. There's so many new elements, and it's just pure fun. This wasn't just another Sonic game, this was something truly special. A total love letter. For fans, by fans. <coughs> Now, I'm sure most people won't know what these games are, or the relevance of them, but this year, the Famicom Detective Club games were localized for the first time, and as a lifelong Nintendo fan, I have wanted this day for decades. The Ayumi Trophy in Melee? God, that tantalized me! I wanted to know who she was! Who are you? So if you don't know, these games were written by Yoshio Sakamoto, who is the director of the Metroid franchise. He's been responsible for most games, he was an advisor on the Prime series, and he wrote and directed the first game, Super Metroid, Metroid Fusion, and the upcoming Metroid Dread. The original games came to Famicom Disk System, and with that larger storage, they just couldn't be ported. They were remade on the Super Famicom, but again, they weren't localized. This franchise avoided the West from 1988 until 2021, and let me tell you, they're pretty special. The presentation for these remakes is fantastic, and the story really holds up. Some aspects and mechanics are very much of their time, but there's kind of a charm to that. But just the fact we got this? It's crazy! This was a game so neatly tied to Japan's gaming history, that for us to get it was bold. What a great choice for a remake, and I hope some of you guys played it. Kind of on a similar note, Advance Wars is getting remade. Now of course we had the original, but I love that these older, dormant franchises are getting another go with these remakes. Hopefully this trend continues. <coughs> but while we're talking about Sakamoto's work, we can't forget Metroid. Now, I feel like it's a bit revisionist to say that Metroid was gone. I mean, yeah, there was definitely a lull, but Metroid's been in pretty much every Nintendo generation, ever. 
We had two last gen, and multiple the gen before that, and multiple before that. So what makes Metroid special enough to be in this video? Well, these ones are special. They're not remakes, they're not spin-offs, and Metroid Dread in particular? If you're a lifelong Nintendo fan, this strikes hard. So way back in 2017, they announced Metroid Prime 4. Wasn't a huge surprise if you finished Federation Force, but the fact it exists is great. That series was on a cliffhanger for 10 years. But the core 2D Metroid series was on a cliffhanger for 19 years. They're doing a double whammy here. Metroid Prime 3 is finally getting a sequel, and Metroid Fusion is finally getting a sequel. Fusion definitely went longer, but the fact is, we're getting two full-fledged AAA Metroid games, and one of them is coming in just a few months. For the first time in over a decade, Metroid feels part of the core pack. Samus was one of the first characters we saw in the DS, and was the first character we saw in the Wii. She was a showrunner for Nintendo, and now, here's her chance again. Okay look, I had given up hope. When Pokemon Snap came to Wii Virtual Console with specific features allowing you to send your pictures to the message board, I said, they're putting a lot of effort into this. That's very suspicious. A motion control Pokemon Snap? That'd be awesome! Didn't happen. Then 3DS came along, and Face Raiders. I said, whoa, the applications of this with Pokemon Snap make so much sense didn't happen. The Wii U! I was playing that Game & Wario minigame where you move around and have to take pictures of people in those buildings, and I said to myself, oh, golly, this is the one. This is how Pokemon Snap is gonna work. If they don't do this, everyone at the Pokemon Company can lick a licky tongue. It didn't happen. We went 22 years without a sequel to Pokemon Snap, and I desired it every single one of those years, but my expectations, they were done. I no longer predicted Pokemon Snap ever returning. But then all of a sudden, in a Pokemon Presents, came new Pokemon Snap. And you know what else? It delivered! New Pokemon Snap is a wonderful game. It takes everything I loved about the original and expands upon it with so much replay value. Every single Pokemon has four states you can submit them in. That's like almost 900 different variants of Pokemon you can submit. It's just a cozy game, and the fact it happened is still something I have to slap myself over to make sure I'm not dreaming. But no, new Pokemon Snap is here. We can play it right now. So at first, I wasn't sure whether to include this one, because Nintendo, it's always a given they're going to do some funky stuff every generation. I was going to put Labo, but then I thought to myself, you know what, Nintendo making cardboard controllers? That's not surprising. If I said that to someone in the past, they'd probably nod along and say, yep, that sounds right. But if you told someone Nintendo would make a fitness RPG, and that RPG would be the best-selling new RPG IP of the entire generation. I'm not sure that they would entirely believe that, but Ring Fit Adventure is the most successful new JRPG of the entire gen. Xeon, Alex, and I have challenged each other to play for two weeks straight, and we've all done it now. And you know what? I'm still going to keep it up. The beauty of this game is it makes you do proper exercise, but it pushes you through RPG tropes. So instead of doing boring reps, you want to do them to deplete a health bar. Experience too, you want to grind and level up. The idea is utter genius, and in my opinion, this is way better than Wii Fit ever was. It really gets you sweating. It also shows the power of the Joy-Con. This camera can do so much. Labo shows it too. You put it in some cardboard or plastic shell, and all of a sudden that shell is a fully functioning controller. I don't think you could have predicted this going to the generation, and it's definitely going to help define the Switch as the years go by. So were there any special Switch moments that you hold dear that I didn't mention? Let us know in the comments below, and of course go to that subscribe button and just give it a good old pat on the back and say, hey, you're doing good. Don't worry about it. And we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.